Ecclesiastes. And we're in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. We started this book several weeks ago. And we've been taking it chapter by chapter. What's up? A microphone? Oh, the kids. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, kids. Junior church dismissed. Sometimes they wave at me back there and I can't see because those lights are shining down and kind of blinds me. And I haven't got one good eye anyway. And it's not real good. Well, we call this series through Ecclesiastes the search for meaning. The search for meaning. People live life a lot of times and they wonder, is it really worth anything? Am I worth anything? Is my life worth anything? Is there any purpose? Philosophers have asked for centuries, who am I? Why am I here and where am I going? What am I supposed to do while I'm here? And only in the Bible do we find the real answer. Life is often perceived as dull and worthless. And it's many times because of a lack of commitment in some areas. And we gain self-respect and purpose and contentment when we make commitments and keep those commitments. And we'll see those in this passage of Scripture. Let's read in Ecclesiastes 5, chapter number 1. I'm, I'm sorry, chapter 5, verse 1. Ecclesiastes 5, verse 1. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven and thou upon earth, therefore let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by the multitude of words. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Play that, pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest, vow, thou shouldest not vow a vow, than thou shouldest vow and not pay. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you'd bless us in this hour of worship, Bible exposure. Lord, may it be life and bread to us as we partake of it. Lord, I pray that you'd empower these feeble lips. And Lord, increase our hearts as we absorb what you have said to us in your precious word. We pray that you'd bless everyone in this room today and all those who may be listening online. Lord, that they would gain comfort, encouragement, and purpose because they've listened to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. People make resolutions on New Year's. Uh, not very many keep them. Uh, kids make resolutions. I, I've, I've wrote down a few of these. Listen to this. Resolutions that kids have made. These are little school-age kids. One of them said, for his resolution, he said, I'll walk on my hands for one whole day. I will go to, another said, I'll go to school with my clothes on backward and see if anyone notices. I doubt if they would in this day and time. <laughs> another one said, I will blow bubbles in my milk until just before I get in trouble. Another, I will communicate with my cat, dog, and cat dog sounds the whole day. Another said, I will start a staring contest with my best friend in the middle of class one day. Another, I will come up with the silliest face ever and wear it to school. I will start a new trend by wearing only one color for a whole week. Another said, I will speak in pig Latin for a whole day during school. And the last one said, I will sing instead of speak for a whole day. <laughs> Those nutty kids, they're almost as dumb as adults. <laughs> Resolutions. Well, 
Interestingly, I did not plan to preach on resolutions today as I have in the past on some occasions. But we're in the series on Ecclesiastes and my endeavor was to just keep on preaching through Ecclesiastes. But in chapter 5, isn't it interesting that it talks about making vows? I did not plan that that way. When I started preaching this several weeks ago, I had no intention of it landing on chapter 5 this day of making vows when people make resolutions. And so the Holy Spirit does things like that sometimes. And so if I preach on your sins someday, don't think I've got your house bugged and I just planned to preach on your sins. (laughs) I didn't do that. And so I didn't do this today, but it turned out we're preaching on vows and commitments. And we come to this passage of Scripture today which seems to talk about a lack of satisfaction, a lack of meaning in life, a lack of purpose, and a lack of self-respect because there's a lack of establishing commitments. Commitments. Where we say, I'm going to do something, and we set out, in fact, to do it. We follow through. And in this passage we've read, we could read the whole chapter, but for sake of time we'll just refer to some verses as we go through it. But you would do well to study the whole chapter and understand it as you go. Uh, we'll find there that, that vows are made and intentions are not really there. In other words, what we just addressed in the scripture we read was talking to people who make vows and they didn't have any intention of keeping those in the first place. And they go to church or in this situation in the scripture they were going to the house of God. Uh, We think today in the New Testament times of the church being the house of God. And so back then they would go to the temple and he said that it's better to go to the house of God and have your ears open and your heart open and listen to what God's got to say than it is to give the sacrifice of fools. Well, the sacrifice of fools was that those people thought if they went to the house of God and they'd make a sacrifice, they wasn't interested in what God had to say. But they'd make a sacrifice for visual approval by their friends and neighbors and family. And by making those sacrifices, they thought they were fooling God. (laughs) You know like I do, God is not fooled. He knows if we make a a vow, a commitment, if we intend to keep it, or if it's just words. And that's why this passage that we read uh, told us to be careful about the words we say. In other words, he's saying it's better better not to say it than it is to say it and not mean it. Huh? If you love your wife, you you ought to tell her so, but you ought to act it out in real life. If you love your husband, uh, saying it is a good thing, But saying it without proving it is rather worthless. Solomon, the penman of Ecclesiastes, is saying here, he's saying, I've I've spent my whole life and, and I've done all of these different things and I've accumulated things and I've become a powerful king. I've done all the wrong things trying to find happiness and contentment and purpose in life. I've I've done all these things and I found that I come up empty. And he's saying, I don't want you to make the same mistakes I've made. And so he is authoring, under the inspiration of God, these passages of Scripture that we're studying in Ecclesiastes. He's saying, I've come to understand that living for God is the only genuine life that really matters for eternity. And he's saying now, Solomon says, now I want to pass that on to you to learn from my mistakes You don't have to reinvent the wheel all over again. And so we're going to see what we can learn about that. What did Solomon learn about cultivating uh, commitments? Commitments. What did Solomon learn? We'll call the message that today. Cultivating commitments. What did he learn? Well, we'll see at least three things in chapter 5 about commitments. Number one, first and foremost and above all else, your commitment to God. 
He talks about going into the house. Look at it again in verse number one. Keep thy foot. Now keep that foot means watch your step, buddy. That's what it means in Hebrew. I guess. I don't know Hebrew and you probably don't either. <laughs> I know a little Hebrew. He runs a, he runs a little snack shop down the street. Your commitment to God is important. He says, keep thy foot. In other words, watch your step. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. And be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God, for God is in heaven. Now watch this. And thou upon earth, therefore, let thy words be few. Uh, in other words... There's some people who try to impress you by talking religious. They'll speak great swelling words to try to impress you. But if you've been around them very long and they're not keeping those commitments, they're not following through on what they said in those words, does that edify you in any way? I doubt it. And we certainly don't fool God. Good intentions in making commitments, vows, resolutions. Uh, it might, might make us feel good for a little while until we begin to let them slip and toss them by the wayside. And then how do we feel? We feel like, well, boy, I blew that. I'm talking about the reason a lot of people don't feel good about themselves and they don't have purpose in life and they don't have contentment and joy and satisfaction is because they don't follow through on their commitments to God. And if there's anyone in the whole universe that we ought to be true to, it ought to be the Lord God of heaven. If we're going to make any promises to God, buddy, we better keep them. It's better not to make. Now, that's not to say that we don't make foolish vows or foolish promises. Sometimes we do. And if it's something that violates the word of God in some other place, then we better confess it and forsake it before it gets out of hand. Remember Jephthah? Jephthah promised God, if I get the victory over here in this battle, I'll sacrifice my daughter as a burnt offering. Well, he got the victory, and then he went home and said, well, I've got no choice. I already opened my, my mouth to God, so i got a daughter, I've got to make you a burnt offering. And he followed through. Well, that was dumb. <laughs> he shouldn't have made that vow in the first place, but after he made it, if he had known what the Bible really teaches, that God's not for human sacrifices. God's not for ignorance. And God's not for making dumb statements. And he made a dumb statement by promising to sacrifice anything that comes out of the door. He said, whatever comes out of the door first, that I will sacrifice. And it turned out to be his daughter. Jephthah could have fell on his face before God and said, Lord, I didn't realize what I was saying. I sure was a dummy. Lord, will you forgive me? I don't want to make my daughter a burnt offering. I should have never said that. Well, would he be going back on his word? Yes, but he's keeping a higher word than sacrificing his daughter ignorantly. And you and I might make some. Now, that doesn't give us an excuse to make promises to somebody. If I promise somebody I'm going to give them uh, $50 an hour to work for me, then... Later, I said, man, that's going to really lower my finances. I don't know if I'll have as much money as I want if I pay them $50 an hour. You already said it. You better stick with it. When you make a promise, keep it unless you're violating. It's just like somebody says, well, I think I'll go to work down at the liquor store. They've got a job opening. I'll go to work for, at the liquor store. Well, you can promise your wife you're going to work at the liquor store, but somebody points out... The Bible teaches that you shouldn't be giving uh, alcohol to your neighbors and friends. Uh, the Bible says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor to drink. So when you discover that was a foolish vow, that was a foolish promise to go to work selling booze when the Bible forbids it, Lord, I've been a fool. Please forgive me. I'm not going to work down there. Okay, so why do people end up feeling less than successful, contented, and fulfilled. A lot of times it's because they make promises to God that they don't keep. Have you ever made God some promises? 
that you didn't keep, be careful. <laughs> be careful. Don't make it unless you're really willing to carry it through. We ought to be people of our word. Does anybody remember? A few of us do. Back in the days where they said a handshake was like a contract. People's word meant something. Make your word count. And you really ought to make sure that your family know that if you promise something, you're going to do everything humanly possible to make it come to pass. When it's pointed out by the Holy Spirit or the Scripture that we have disappointed God and broken promises to Him, many times instead of admitting it, that it's a mistake, it's a sin, I've done wrong, I've been a fool. Many times we just go on our way and ignore it. And then later on it comes back to haunt us because the Holy Spirit, if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit will come back and let you know that you've done wrong. You promised and you didn't follow through. And then that deflates you like a flat tire. And you feel empty and unfulfilled and not contented because you failed God. Do we as humans have failures? Yeah, but we ought not let it happen if it's in our power to change it. Find out what God wants from you. Commit to Him. And then follow through. In this coming year, that's my advice. Some, some like Solomon realize that they've wasted some years and they lived for self and lived for pleasure and lived for riches, lived for entertainment. You can fill in the blank. Uh, lived for all those things still living for God. We ought to make commitments. If we're going to make commitments, we ought to make them to God. First and foremost. We, some people say, well, I don't want to commit anything to God because I'm afraid I can't follow through. So you don't ever commit anything? We ought to. Some, some people say, well, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm deciding not to promise the Lord that I'll do anything because I might not be able to accomplish it. So I'll just let somebody else work in the nursery. I'm not going to promise that because I might not keep it. Uh, I'll let somebody else teach that Sunday school class because I don't want to promise something I can't follow through on. I'll let somebody else sing in the congregation. The other people can sing, but I'm not. I'll just not make any commitment to do that because somebody else can sing. I'll let someone else fill the empty pews on Sunday. Somebody else can do that. I don't want to promise God that I'll be there and, and then not show up. I'll let someone else train my children to live for God. But I'm not going to commit to it and put the time into it. I've just got too much to do. In other words, you're more committed to the world than you are to God. I'm saying that it's not wrong to make promises to God. Just don't make empty promises to God. We ought to make some vows to God that I will do certain things that you want me to do, things that's in the Scripture. I ought to be able to witness to people because God says, you shall be witnesses unto me. I ought to be able to give praise with my lips because He says I ought to. I ought to be able to promise God, I'll go to church because God says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. And so is it wrong to make promises to God? God? No, we ought to make promises to God, but then keep them because that's when we fall down and completely feel empty and unfulfilled because we either didn't make any vows to God or because we made them and didn't mean it. Somewhere along the line, if you don't ever commit anything to God, dear brother, sister, you're going to come up feeling empty. It might be on your deathbed, but somewhere it's going to come up empty. If you think that God doesn't expect you to commit something to Him, you are very mistaken. Jesus Christ said that He is to have the preeminence in everything. That means if there's two things going on and God's in one of them, I better select the one thing that God's in. He's to have the preeminence. I've had so many people to tell me that they wouldn't come Church. I'd invite them to come to church and I said, well, I don't want to make you a promise, preacher, because uh, I may or may not show up. You know what that means? I ain't coming. <laughs> I don't want to commit to be there. In other words, I'm going to let somebody else do it. I'm not going to commit. 
You know what I would tell them, and I have told them many times? They'd say, well, I don't want to make a promise and not keep it. I said, well, okay, I agree with you on that. So make the promise and keep it. I mean, do you get up on Monday morning and go to work? You committed to that. How about getting up on Sunday morning and going to church? What if I told my wife? And honey, in our wedding vows, I know I said I'd keep you in sickness and in health. But you know, you're looking pretty wrinkled and sickly these days. I'm going to have to get rid of you. (laughs) How would she feel about that? She'd probably wonder, I guess you didn't mean those vows then. What uh, What if I told my kids, kids, it's just groceries are getting so expensive, I'm not going to be able to keep you anymore. You're going to have to find somebody else to live with. How would they feel? And how would God look at that? Well, how do you think God looks at it when we make Him vows and then we don't keep them? Or how does it make God feel when we don't make any commitments at all? To have a life of meaning, we must make some commitments and never Consider turning back. Just make the commitments and do it. Amen? When it comes to making a genuine commitment to God, we can trust that He loves us, He knows what's best, and He's going to take care of the situation. It's like we can trust, we can trust God to save our soul, but we can't trust Him in everyday commitments. Huh? Huh? If he can save my soul for all eternity, I figure he can take care of those other smaller commitments, don't you? Hello? When Julius Caesar landed on the shores of Britain, he marched all of his soldiers up to the top of a cliff and had them all to look down back at the sea, at the ships in which they had just arrived. Every one of those ships were on fire, burning. They were there for a military conquest Caesar had the ships burned. They had no way of turning back. He said, okay, men, the ships are gone. Now let's go conquer that city. And they had nowhere to go but forward. You know what we need to do? We need to make commitments kind of like Caesar did with his troops. We need to make some commitments to God and say, I'm burning my ships. I'm burning the bridges behind me. I'm going forward. I'm not going to back up. I'm not going to back off. I've made a promise. And God, I'm going to serve you. Your son died on the cross of Calvary for me. The least I can do is make some little promises that I can keep to you. He who aims at nothing, it is said, shall surely hit his target. There's a second commitment to consider in our text this morning. Your commitment to others. Your commitment to God comes first. But then there's another commitment here in chapter 5. And being committed to the Lord and to His will opens all kinds of blessed rewards and contentment and fulfillment in our life. A lot of people's life, like Solomon's, coming up empty. I don't feel like I'm accomplishing anything. Well, if you have made some commitments to God and are keeping them, then next we need to make certain commitments to others and keep them. No man is an island unto himself. We all kind of depend on each other. Isn't that right? Ecclesiastes 5, 8 through 10. Watch this. Verse number 8. If thou seest the oppression of the poor and violent perverting of judgment and justice in the province... Marvel not of that matter, for he that is higher than the highest regardeth, and there be higher than they. Moreover, the profit of the earth is for all. The king himself is served by the field. He that loveth, what that means, the king is served by the field. The king's got to eat some, he's got to eat some groceries too. Uh, the corn and the potatoes and the vegetables that grow out in the field, the wheat. King's got to eat. So just because there might be somebody out there that's poor uh, harvesting the food out of the field, the king's benefiting from that too. We all need each other. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. 
we have to make commitments to God and keep them to have a fulfilling life. And we have to make commitments to others because we can't survive in this world all alone. We need other people and they need us. One of the things that's, that's been said, and I believe it's absolutely true, is that we need others and they need us. We need each other. Are you the kind of person that others see as a committed friend or comrade who will find a way to help when needed? A missionary society once wrote to David Livingston and asked, he was down in Africa, pioneer missionary in Africa. This was a long time ago before the world was industrialized like it is now. And the missionary society wrote to David Livingston and asked, have you found a good road to where you are? If so, we want to send other men to join you. Livingston wrote back, if you have men who will only come if there's a good road, I don't want them. I want men who will come if there's no road at all. Livingston said, hey, if you've got to have a road to come down here and help me, just forget it. You make yourself a road. Friend, we have to be willing to be a committed friend. We have to be committed to other people and go the extra mile to see that we make commitments and we stick with it. Que sera, sera. In Spanish, in English it means whatever will be, will be. Some people live by that motto. Well, everything is going to happen is just going to happen and I can't change anything. Solomon got to that point in his life. He said, man, it just looks like everything I planned went haywire, nothing satisfying me. I'm finding no fulfillment even in the riches and the power and authority that I have. All the possessions, none of it matters. So, que sera, sera. You know, whatever's going to happen is just going to happen. doesn't matter who I am or what I do. You know, we're all going to be born and we're all going to live and we're all going to die. Nothing we can do about it. We're just here like a puppet on the end of a string. <laughs> and he was feeling pretty empty. Well, God does have an overall plan for mankind. But that doesn't mean he pulls all of your strings. You have some decisions you can make. He allows you to make. He is sovereign, but he allows you to make some decisions. And you can affect the way things turn out. And one of those things we can affect is whether we have friends or not. If a man hath friends, he must show himself friendly. If a man hath friends, why is it that he has friends? Because he showed himself friendly. I've heard some people say, man, uh, it's, just, it's just not worth anything. You know, people don't like me. I don't like them, you know. <laughs> and nothing can change it. I'm just unlikable. And anyway, they're probably not likable either. I don't want to have anything to do with them. Um, we, have an, we have an effect on whether people like us or not. Now, some may have more friends than others especially if you've got a lot of money. I don't know if those are true friends, though, do you? But I believe, according to the Scripture, we have more friends than we would have had if we show ourselves friendly. If, you're not, if you never try to help others by making commitments to them, then probably not going to be that they make many commitments to you. You can make life sweeter and more valuable for others when you make commitments to them and keep them. I made that card I mentioned for my wife this morning. Now, guys, I'm trying to help you out here. You, if you just take a piece of typing paper, fold it in half and write a Write a nice card, draw a little heart on it or a bouquet of flowers or something and give it to your wife. She will appreciate that probably more than she would a card from the card store. Handwritten means it came from your heart. Somebody else didn't write it and you bought it. Write those cards and give to your wife. Wives, you can do that for your husband. And you can save $6. 
Just kidding. I told her things in that card, ways that she was so special to me. I just I took her a cup of coffee. She, I got up early. Uh, it was about 5.30, I think, and I went to make some coffee. And, and I made some coffee and made that card and took it back in there, took her coffee and that card and gave it to her. And, and as I was walking out the bedroom door, I wished her happy birthday, and I walk, started walking back out the door to go back and do some study. And uh, she said, oh, there's a letter inside of it. I said, uh, yeah, yeah, it's handwritten, read it. And she read all those little sweet things I wrote to her about how special she was to me. And I went back to my studies and sat there in the chair studying. And she came through the bedroom door after a while and came over and bent over and kissed me and told me how special I was to her. You know, if you never make commitments to anybody, you don't have special times like that. If you make others feel special, they'll think you're special. Hello? You can make life meaningful by making real commitments to God, real commitments to others, and then third and last, a commitment to yourself. In Shakespeare's Hamlet, the phrase was said from a father to his son, to thine own self be true. In other words, don't lie to yourself. Be authentic. Be real. Don't try to deceive yourself. Don't try to pretend to be somebody you're not. Be who God wants you to do. To thine own self be true. Solomon, stay with me here. Solomon had fallen into, at one point in his life, Solomon had fallen into an attitude of, oh, woe is me. No matter what I do, no matter what I try, nothing is bringing fulfillment and contentment. Oh, woe is me. You know, Eeyore? Eeyore? Remember the little cartoon guy? Yeah, just a rain cloud follows him around, and uh, he's just always depressed about everything. Friend, if you're a child of God, you're a child of the king, you've got no reason to go around saying, oh, woe is me. Nothing ever works out. Nobody likes me. Nothing ever goes as I've planned. I don't have money like other folks do. I'm always sick. My health is not good. I never have much fun in life. Nothing I do is enjoyable. Not many people like me. I don't have many friends. My childhood holds so many tragedies I could just never be happy. I've worked hard and long for this money and the possessions I've gathered. Still it hadn't brought me happiness so nothing's going to work. God doesn't answer my prayers like he does for other people. My temptations always win. I promise God that I'm going to get victory over that one. Next thing I know, I've fallen victim again. I've decided that I'm just going to be poor all my life. Nothing's ever going to change. And anyway, those people that's got money are snobby and I don't like them anyway. Probably a little bit of sour grapes. You've heard the fable, I know, about where the the little fox in the woods saw the grapevines up above and clusters of nice-looking grapes hanging down and the little fox jumped and jumped and jumped trying to get those grapes and never could. He wore himself out. Finally, disgusted, he walks away and muttering to himself and says, they're probably sour grapes anyway. Wasn't worth going after. Some people come to that point in their life and they say, well, I've tried this and I've tried that. I'm just going to be poor and nothing I can do about it. Well, there's, there's no virtue in being rich. 
unless you use it for the kingdom of God, help others. But there's no virtue in being poor either. Are you listening? You can be rich and godly, and you can be poor and godly. But just because you're rich doesn't make you better than anybody else, and just because you're poor doesn't make you more virtuous than anybody else. Some people have resigned themselves, well, I don't have anything, and that's fine because God loves poor people more anyway. No, God loves everybody. And if you accumulated some things, you got a nice house, a nice car, you know, if you live for God, He's not mad at you because you worked hard and got some things. And if you're poor and you've worked as hard as you can and hadn't accumulated anything, but you tried, He's not mad at you either. So take comfort in that. The negative, poor me attitude is the ruin of a many a man and woman and child. Poor me. Oh, and nothing ever turns out good for me. And that's the gloomy attitude they carry every day. Are you with me on this? Are you listening? The gloomy attitude, the negative spirit. Now look, I'm not preaching Norman Vincent Peelism, the power of positive thinking. But I am saying if you're a child of God and your faith is in Him, I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me. That means that I can do anything that He means for me to do and I ought to make some commitments to myself and to protect my self-confidence and my self-worth. I believe in self-worth. I think the self-esteem thing is blown out of proportion a little bit. But I believe that, that self-respect is a real thing. And it, look, if, if you're poor and you work hard, you can have self-respect. And if you work hard and you become rich and you share it and you use it for the kingdom of God, then there is virtue in that and you can have self-respect. But don't go around with a gloomy attitude and get locked into, well, I just wasn't meant to have anything. Work harder. Go for the better job. Nothing wrong with it. I know a, a Christian who's a millionaire and has been for many, many decades and he's used his money to plant churches and support missions and I mean big time, big money. Do you think God's mad at that rich man? No, I don't think so. God, See, he's giving abundantly and God blesses him abundantly. I think I'm going to try that. Ecclesiastes 5.12 is our, is our text for this thought of making commitments to self and then keeping them. Ecclesiastes 5.12, The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. He's saying that if, if you're poor and you've worked as hard as you can work to get whatever it is that you need to live on and you still don't have much, then you'll sleep good because your conscience is not bothering you. But the guy who forsook everything around him, everybody around him, and forsook God in order to become rich. He said he's going to be pretty nervous when he lays his, pillow, or lays his head on the pillow at night. And he's not going to sleep good. If he's been cheating people, robbing people, he's not going to sleep good. Either way, the laboring man has a sweet, peaceable sleep. Verse 18 in our chapter Behold that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all of his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life which God giveth him. For it is his portion. What's Solomon saying? Solomon's saying, if, if you've accumulated some things, you can still be happy, you can still be contented, you can still be, you can still be rich toward God because this is what God's given you. But if you're poor, whatever little dab you've got, acknowledge that God gave that to you. While somebody over here is eating a nice ribeye steak and all you've got is chicken noodle soup, say, thank you, Lord, for that chicken noodle soup. If I had a steak, I'd eat it, but this is what I've got and I'm going to enjoy it. It'll taste just as good to me as a steak does to him. If you've got an old junker car, If you're content and acknowledge that God gave it to you, you can be as fulfilled and contented in his life as you choose to be. If you say, 
thank you, Lord, for my old junker car. I'll save it for another 30 years and maybe I can sell it as a classic. <laughs> What's Solomon saying? He's saying, enjoy what you've got. If it's much or little, enjoy what you've got. You can have a faithful outlook, a positive out outlook, a, an optimistic outlook because whatever it is God wants you to have, you can have it. Much or little, enjoy what you've got. My parents grew up in the Depression days. This was in the days when nobody had jobs much, and they worked hard when they could find a job. They worked from daylight till sundown, and sometimes later, just to try to get a little bit of food on the table. And they worked hard, hard. They, they'd walk down the hill maybe a quarter of a mile to a spring and, and dip up a bucket of water and carry it all the way to the house so they could have a little water. And boy, don't you know they protected every drop of that water because it was precious. We turned the faucet on let it run now. I, I, I suspect today's generation doesn't know what it means to value things as much as they did. My parents grew up in that time, and, and, a, and a little bit of that rubbed off on me, not enough. But when we know the value of things, whether it's little or much, and we thank God for it, we can sit around the supper table at night with our family and be happy and contented and fulfilled because God gave it to us, whether it be little or much. Well, I could preach another hour on this, but I think... I'll end with telling you this story. Teddy Roosevelt, on October 14th, 1912, he was campaigning in Milwaukee, and he was shot by a saloon keeper. And the bullet lodged in his chest after penetrating the steel eyeglass case he had in his pocket and a 50-page folded uh, speech that he was going to give. The bullet went through both of those and then lodged in his chest just as he was mounting the platform to give his speech. He was a rugged outdoorsman and he hunted big game enough to know that if, if something was wounded very well, very much, he'd probably be coughing up blood and he, he was not coughing up blood so he figured he was good to go ahead and give the speech. <laughs> he gave a 90-minute speech with a bullet in him and blood seeping out into his shirt and he told the folks, he said, now, I don't know if you know it or not, I was shot just a little while ago, but he said, it takes more than that to stop a bull moose. <laughs> and he kept on until he finished his speech. You know what I think? I think we need some people today who will be something other than wimpy, whiny Christians that say, bless the Lord, he's given me all that I need, he's given me what he wants me to have, and I'll serve him no matter what, I'm just going to keep on going, and I'm going to tough things out. If, if times are hard, I'll just get tough. Be like the Marines. When the, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Right, Brother Lloyd? That's what we do. We need a bunch of Marines and Teddy Roosevelt's in life. And just realize, hey, I may have it tough, but I'm not going to have a negative attitude about it. I'm not going to go around whining and being a victim. I'm not going to go around expecting that somebody else ought to take care of me. I'm going to work hard, supply for my own family, and I'm going to have a good attitude about it. I'm going to just praise the Lord no matter what happens. That is the conclusion Solomon came to. You can enrich your life by paying attention to your commitments. Commit to God. Commit to others. And commit to yourself and then keep them. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you'd bless us this morning. Lord, help us to come to the conclusion, as Solomon did, that life is as good as we make it, actually. Because whatever we have comes from you. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be true to ourselves and not fool ourselves into thinking things are different than what they really are doesn't mean, Lord, that we can just do as we please, but we ought to do as you will. I pray that you'd bless us. Help us to make decisions and commitments that will be God-honoring. I pray for those who have never trusted Christ as Savior. I pray that this would be the very morning that say, Dear Lord, I'm a sinner. I know that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, and I'm accepting him. I'm trusting him. I'm placing my faith in him this very morning to trust to trust Him and to, for Him to become my Savior. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Would you stand with me, please? Our heads.